Well, as you have already probably assessed or aware, I am not Pastor Marcus, (laughs) so surprise. (laughs) Um, But I am glad to be here this morning. Every time I have the opportunity to share the Word of God or present the Word of God, it's a privilege, it's an honor, and and I don't take that lightly. Um, We're going to continue our series in Expectations of the Church, um, and today's title is Being a Disciple of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to share just a brief testimony with you about who I am, because I know sometimes the new person on here, you probably don't know a lot about me, and it's like, okay, there's a new guy, I had know nothing about him, and he's speaking to me now. Um, so my family's here, I picked them up at the airport last night, they got to spend a week down in Florida, so slight change in temperature, um, <laughs> about 45 degrees. Um, and for those that are thinking, okay, can Jeremy handle the cold? I'll be okay, I grew up in Wisconsin, um, this, is, this is mild compared to up there. Um, but I, I do count it a privilege. And the reason why I'm so passionate about discipleship is I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in both my parents were alcoholics. And so I did the only thing I knew how to do when I graduated, I left. <laughs> um, I joined the military and little did I know that God was gonna have plans for my life there. And I still remember to this day, November 3rd, 2003, he brought a man named Eddie to share the gospel with me. And right there he said, no matter what you've done in your past, your present, or your future, you have a God that loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. He said, do you, want to, do you want to make that decision? I said, I need to make that decision now. And right there, November 3rd, 2003, 12 o'clock on the Navy base right there, I gave my life to Christ. And I didn't know what that all meant, you know. I, I knew I gave my life. I know a change that had took place in my life, but I didn't know what that all meant. And so shortly after that, I got, when I got out of the military, I got plugged into a church there in the Orlando area. And I had an associate pastor kind of take me under his wing and disciple me. And we went through a series called uh, Experiencing God. I'm sure some of you have heard of that before. Awesome series. But it wasn't the series that changed my life. It was someone taking the time to invest into my life. And that's what changed my life. And so uh, as as I'm meeting with this pastor, um, I'm seeing all around me a lot of people get saved. And I asked him a question. I said, all these people are responding to the gospel, but what's being done with them after? You know, they were coming to a saving knowledge of Christ, but they weren't being discipled. It was like, it'd be like me having uh, our youngest one is four years old. It'd be like her being born and being like, okay, you're on your own now. There you go. There was, not, there was no discipleship happening. So that's why the Lord has really put on my heart investing into the next generation for Christ. And so if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to John 8, verses 31 through 38. Or follow along on the screens as well. It says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are an offspring of Abraham. We have never been enslaved to anybody or anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. And I I know that you are an offspring of Abraham. Yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen in my father, and you do what you heard from your father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and open your word. Lord, I know that there's nothing that I have to say, Lord. It's only you speaking through me. So I pray, Lord, that as I decrease, Lord, that you would increase. And I pray right now, Lord, that you would Allow our hearts to be receptive to what you would have to say to us. Lord, show us what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Show us what it means to abide in you. And Lord, we know that if anything good happens, it's on account of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Abide means to remain or stay in, spiritually unchanged. Now, I wanted this morning, I wanted to have a fish tank up here, but for sake of the carpet being completely soaking wet... I want you to imagine that there's a fish tank right here. And the fish tank's about halfway full of water. And I would take a sponge and put it in the water. Not only is the sponge in the water, the water is in the sponge. 
This is what it means to abide, that when we abide in his word, we're not only in the word, but the word is in us. And so I really want to just capture that thought. If you get nothing out of what I say today, that's the main thought today is how do we abide in him? And so I believe in this, this passage, Jesus is giving us a stern warning. He's saying, listen, they're both believers. If you see there in verse 31, it says, and Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. We're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about believers. One is abiding in God's word and the truth is setting him free. The other is practicing sin and the word finds no place in them. And so this morning, I want us to look at four concerns that are associated with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. First, we have to address the issue, are we willing to live a life of convenience or inconvenience? See, a cultural Christian follows Jesus if it's convenient for them. A disciple follows Jesus even when it's not convenient. Listen, this isn't the first time we saw this in the book of John. If you rewind a little bit or turn back to John 6, kind of setting the scene for what's happening here, uh, the disciples were following Jesus. This wasn't the 12 disciples. This was many disciples. And in John 6, verses 66, it says, and he says to these disciples, he's like, you must physically eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And he's like, this is a hard statement. Who can understand it? And then in verse 66, he says, it says this. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answers him and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. They were believers, but when things got hard, they walked away. So I want to ask you a rhetorical question. Nobody answered us. Is there anything in your life specifically that if Jesus were to ask you, it would be too hard for you to, to accept? Too hard for you to understand? See, if we're honest, if I sat down with each and every one of you, we all want a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You're here today, right? But we want it to work within the constructs of what we think it means to be a Christian, well, I'll be a Christian if it's convenient. I'll be a Christian if it's this model. If there's anything I've learned over the years, it never works the way that I have planned. The Bible tells us the more we know about God, the more we realize we don't know anything. And so also in verse 31, he says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Listen, truth is not what I decide truth to be. God's word is truth. Regardless of whether I believe it or not, doesn't make it any less true. It's still true. It was interesting. I was scrolling through my Facebook. I don't go on Facebook very often, um, but I was scrolling through my Facebook, and I saw yesterday, and I didn't plan this out, but I saw I had posted a quote three years ago yesterday, and it was a quote by Francis Chan, and it says, whenever I come across something in the Bible that I disagree with, I have to assume that I'm wrong. It's not me trying to fit it to, to my lifestyle or if it's convenient or I need it to say this so that I feel comfortable. I have to adjust my life to what the word of God says. See, being a disciple of Jesus is more than going through a curriculum. It's opening up your life to allow people to see every aspect of your life. Showing them that you're not perfect, you don't have everything together, but rather that in every circumstance, God is teaching you something that others can learn from as well. I remember back when we were living in North Carolina, and I was, I'm going to pick on Landon just for a second. Um, I was bringing him back from preschool. I think he was about three and a half, just before his fourth, fourth birthday. And we're stopped at a stoplight, and the light turns green, and I hear from the back seat, come on, man, just go already. And I was like, Landon, where did you hear that from? He goes, you, Dad. Instantly, conviction sets in. I'm like, I wanted to be prideful and be like, no, you didn't hear that from me. Surely you didn't. And then I thought about it, and I was like, man, I have said that. And I said, I'm so sorry, Landon. Can you forgive me? Dad was impatient. He said it. He said something rashly. Can you forgive me? Of course, like three seconds later, he's like, Dad, what are we having for lunch? Like, he totally forgot about it. He didn't even remember what I was saying. But isn't that true? It's, it's showing people that we don't have to have a perfect life. 
See, when we're a disciple of Jesus, it's not letting others just see the good that God's doing in our life. It's letting them see how we respond to our mistakes, how we respond to our trials, how we respond to the circumstances that have entered all of our lives that we didn't expect. And then the second concern I want us to see is that when you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to be more apt to give than to receive. See, a cultural Christian asks, what can Jesus do for me? A disciple asks, what can I do for Jesus? I'm sure we all have been in church long enough where we've heard of someone that maybe have left the church, and I've heard of people leaving the church, and it, it goes something like this, well, I'm just not getting fed. And I always kind of turn my head sideways and think, is it the church's job to feed you? Or is it to teach you how to feed yourself? See, we, we want to come and get fed. And we want to be part of God's community. But if the only time we're getting fed is on Sunday mornings, we're malnourished. We're not getting all that God has intended in our lives. And so we've been going through a series with the youth in the book of Ephesians. And a couple of weeks ago, we came across Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. And it talks about the different gifts that God uses in the body of Christ. And so verse, Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So the word prophet there would be the same as someone that proclaims the gospel, a pastor. And I asked the teenagers, I said, who are the saints in this passage? And they said, well, we are. And I said, so it's the job of the pastors, the shepherds, the elders, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And I said, but so often I feel the church gets it backwards. We have expectations that pastors are to do everything, right? They're the spiritually holy ones, right? They have to do everything. But what that does is it keeps them from doing what God has intended them to do. It'd be no different than if I had an organ that wasn't working correctly. What if my liver wasn't working properly? Well, the rest of my body would have to compensate to make, to make my body function. And the same thing is true in the body of Christ is God has given us each gifts to use for his glory. But when we're not operating in the body of Christ the way God has intended, then it's not working the way that he has functioned it to be. And what's great about that passage as well, it doesn't say that any gifts are less important than other gifts. Me preaching this morning isn't less important than someone serving on security or someone serving in the kids' ministry. They're all equal parts in the body of Christ. And I asked them, I said, imagine what the body of Christ would look like if all the parts were working and functioning properly. It'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? What is it that when you do it, you feel closest to God? That may be a gift that God has given you. I remember serving in many ministries, but I had a girl come up to me one time when we were in Florida, and she's like, God has really given me a passion to do something about trafficking that's going on in Tampa. Because if you don't know, Tampa's one of like the top areas in the world for, for trafficking. And I said, okay, what are you going to do with it? And she paused for a second. She's like, well, no, I brought it to you for you to do something about it. And I said, that's not the way God works. If God has put a passion and a desire on your heart for something, it's because he wants you to do something about it. And I said, your passion and what God gears you to do won't be the same passions that I have. So I challenge you, church, if God is laying a passion on your heart to serve in any ministry, whether it's kids ministry or student ministry or security, wherever it is, and you feel God leading that way, be obedient to do it. Because that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. The second thing, see, when we're abiding in him, that's the only way we're going to know our gifts. Apart from it, we won't know our gifts. And then the third thing I want us to see about being a, a concern that we must face about being a disciple of Jesus Christ is are we more concerned about the benefits versus the sacrifice? See, a, a cultural Christian enjoys the benefits of the cross 
and a disciple embraces the sacrifice of the cross. See, a cultural Christian has a wrong perspective of God's grace. They think, well, I can keep sinning, I can keep doing life the way I want, because I've already been forgiven. They're only seeing the benefits. To sin as you wish, with no boundaries and no consequences, Jesus clearly teaches that this is backwards. Those who live however they want are actually living in illusion. They claim freedom, but in reality, they are trapped in the bondage to their sin. Only the disciple of Jesus Christ can experience true freedom. Sin will always take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and make you give up more than you want to give. Isn't it crazy that we don't even realize that? That we think, okay, well, I can sin and do things the way I want, but it's an illusion. We're, we're bonding ourselves to sin. But when we think, oh, well, if I have to serve in here, or do this or do that, we're thinking, oh, I'm being confounded to that, but it actually brings true freedom. A disciple of Jesus will not desire to sin because they know of the sacrifice that was made for them. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love towards us. And yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So every time I've lied or cheated or stolen something or had a horrible thought or talked bad about someone or gossiped, every time I've done that, Jesus hung on the cross for those, for the past, present, and future all at the same time. And then the last point I want us to see is about the concern that we must face about being a follower of Jesus Christ. Is are you a fan of Jesus or a follower of Jesus? See, a cultural Christian is a fan of Jesus. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. See, the cultural Christian may look at Jesus and they're like, wow, that's awesome. He's done some good works. He has some good teachings. But they haven't allowed him to change or transform their lives. A disciple will live their lives according to Luke 9, verses 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And he says to do it daily. See, when I accepted Christ, actually November 3rd in a few days will be 20 years ago I gave my life to Christ. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. But what this passage is saying, I I realized shortly after it, is giving my life to Christ every single day, saying, God, do what you want with my life. Allow me to go to the places you want me to go. Have the conversations you want want me to have. Because I know it's going to bring you glory. But it's a daily process. James Merritt put it this way. Jesus did not leave heaven, come to earth, live, die, and come back from the grave to make Christians. He did to make disciples. As we close, I want us to look back at verse 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When we are truly abiding in him, when we're truly his disciples, we will be inconvenienced. We will be giving people We will be sacrificial with our time and our money and our energies. And we will be a follower of Jesus Christ. I remember a couple weeks ago, uh, Landon was in the kitchen making some toast. And uh, he goes into the drawer and he pulls out a knife. And it's broken. And and my wife goes, ah, just throw it away. Get another one. No big deal. And Landon paused for a second. He's like, no, Mom, we're a lot like that, that knife. We're broken and God still chooses to use us. And I was like, okay, little evangelist over here. Um, Isn't that great? We can be broken, but God still chooses to use us. He still desires to have a relationship with us. And so a minute, I want to let you have the opportunity to respond to the gospel. Maybe you're here today and you need to make a decision for the first time. Maybe the first decision you need to make is to have a relationship with him. You've never made that decision before. Or maybe you're here this morning, and if you're honest with yourself, deep down you know you haven't been abiding in his word or abiding in him. 
It's never too late to come to his feet. It's never too late to come and lay the things at the feet of Jesus and say, all right, now's the time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can open your word. And Lord, even though we're broken and flawed people, you have a perfect design in everything that you do. I pray, Lord, that each day this week, month, year, you would show us what it means to be a disciple for you, to abide in you. Too often we do life on our own, thinking that we know best, Lord, but we just need to rely on your spirit, Lord. So I pray in a moment that those that need to make a decision that they would come, before, come forward, though myself and some men will be down here to pray with them. But Lord, you are Lord of our lives, every aspect. So we give you the honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.